In 2002, I was at a lab conference, Knutepunkt. And there in the bar, late at night, I met Erik Fatland. Erik Fatland, it turned out, was a drunken Dane. He introduced himself as, yeah, hello. My name is uh, Erik Fatland, and I have very short arms. I was a bit confused uh, at first. I said, yes, yes, my name is Erik Fatland, and, uh, uh, and what's your name? Erik Fatland, very short arms. It turned out they were role-playing. Um, for many years I thought that they were role-playing cool people. It turned out they were role-playing people, uh, participants who had funny names. <laughs> of course, I don't have very short arms, witness. Um, but it made me think, this guy uh, didn't know anything about me, so he was just making shit up as he went along. But what if he were trying to play me? What if he was try really trying to play a different person? What if someone tried to play you? What would you need to tell them for them to be able to play you? Which memories from your past life are important for you to have access to today? It's kind of difficult, isn't it? But that episode got me thinking about characters. And luckily I wasn't the only person in the Oslo scene to think about characters. There are quite a lot of people in the Oslo scene who have thought quite a lot about characters in the last decade or two. And in this presentation, I'm going to try to summarize all of the good advice that has popped up from millions of conversations in the Oslo LARP scene. It's the seventh time I hold this presentation. And every time afterward, I feel like, no, it's not quite right. I need to adjust a little bit. And so it's no longer the same presentation as it was the first time. But just to tell you first what I'm not going to talk about. There are many things I'm not going to talk about. But as regards to, to characters, to go from nothing to a character, there are basically three steps. You need to come up with uh, an idea, a good playable character idea. You need to communicate this idea to the player uh, so that they understand what you expect of them and what they need to come up with themselves. Uh, and they need to interpret it. They need to talk, turn this idea of another person into a living, breathing, interacting, role-played uh, human being. And that's the part I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the first two parts. Now, you'll probably all remember every detail of Christopher's uh, present slide, uh, fader talk earlier today. But in case you don't, there is a scale going from the organizer doing all the work of defining the character to the player doing all the work of defining the character. And there is a fertile middle ground here where uh, player and uh, organizer co-create the character. And I'm mostly going to be talking about the edge of the fader where the organizer writes the character. But that doesn't make it irrelevant for the other parts of the fader because it turns out that a lot of the things you need to think about when writing characters are also things you need to think about when designing a character co-creation system or if you are give, as a player are given the job of coming up with your own character it's pretty much the same stuff you need to think about then. So I'll talk as if the only way we created characters was for organizers to write and distribute them uh, but keep in mind that uh, this uh, applies generally. And a very important caveat, nothing is true, everything is permissible. Uh, there are some uh, near universal truths in LARP design, there are some very well established rules of thumbs. Uh, when it comes to character design, the certainties are much fewer. When I look at the characters designed by different LARP rights, I see a lot of the personalities and the unique artistic expressions of the creators in them. And there is no universally right way to work with characters. Every rule I introduce you to in this lecture can and should be broken. And, I, and if I say something that's as absolutely certain, I hope someone goes off and tries to prove me wrong. But at the same time, there are some thumbnail rules. It's more fun to break rules if there actually are rules to begin with. So what's a character, anyway? Uh, it's someone or something you pretend to be when role-playing. Role-playing? Why are we then not calling it character-playing? Uh, what's a role anyway? We Scandinavians are a little bit confused about it because we don't usually talk about playing characters. We talk about spillerolle, uh, which is playing role. 
Uh, but the two words in the English language have somewhat different meanings. Uh, I mentioned yesterday in introducing LARP history, Jakob Levy Marino, and he's pretty much the guy who came up with the term role the way it's used today, uh, both when it comes to role playing and uh, within sociology. <coughs> and he of course used a metaphor, because our role was originally uh, a part in a theatre play. You would take, um, if you're going to play Hamlet, in order to prevent copyright violations, which was a thing also in the 1500s, uh, you would take out all the lines that are spoken by Hamlet and give them to the actor, but not any of the other lines. So he couldn't go off and sell the bootleg script. And those lines belonging to you, that would be a role, a role, a role, a role. So the original meaning of role is kind of the same as character, but the metaphor has slipped. So role now is used about things like being a mother, being a father, the father role, the mother role, the man role, the woman role, uh, the boss role, the employee role, and so on. Uh, roles tend to be positions you inhabit in particular social contexts. I'm inhabiting a role right now. The role I'm having right now is that of speaker. The role of speaker comes with certain rights. I get to talk and be listened to. The role of audience uh, comes with limitations on how much you can talk and how much you can move around. And these are all created by social norms in our society. The moment I walk off the stage, I will leave the context where I'm playing the speaker role. Uh, and you will leave the context where you are playing the audience roles. And a lot of these things become very visible the moment somebody begins breaking those invisible rules. Uh, like if, if people in the audience stand up and begin throwing balls at each other, for example, and then you watch the reaction of the rest of the audience. Uh, so, an example of characters, Bob and Matilda, they are uh, uh, parents of Lisa and Sven. Uh, but the roles they inhabit for part of the LARP are those of father and mother. Napoleon Bonaparte uh, inhabited for a while the role of Emperor of France. He also inhabited other roles, such as child, officer, uh, father, lover, uh, prisoner, escapee, and so on. Roles do not apply to just one person. It's part of their characteristic that the same role can be inhabited by many people at the same time, the way this entire room now is inhabiting the audience role. So a character is a fictive person. A role is a part played by a person, fictive or real, in a given social context. Now a LARP is a society inside a society inside a society. That's just to make things more confusing for us. <laughs> the primary society we inhabit when role playing is a fictive one. It's a society that the characters belong to. Uh, it is the family Anderson, or it is the artist community at New Voices of Art. These are uh, approaching or approximating real societies in that they have their own roles, they have their own rules, they have their own norms, and so on. But of course, this is enabled by another society, which is a society of players, where we as players have decided uh, to engage in role playing, and when, where the organizer role is also present the facilitator role, the NPC role, and so on. And all of this, of course, takes place inside the confines of um, the society we inhabit regularly. And that means that roles are not characters, but they matter a lot to character design. And I think uh, in two days you will play uh, When Our Destinies Meet, uh, which is a very interesting LARP design, because it doesn't actually provide you with characters, but it does provide you with roles. But it's primarily characters we're going to talk about. So what is our character anyway? Well, someone you pretend to be when role-playing. And we use the word both about the person I pretended to be when I was role-playing, but also uh, about the input you got from the designers. So at the moment somebody sends me a three-page PDF with the life history and tells me, here's your character, then those three pages are a character. But also when I go off and I do my own interpretation of those three pages when interacting with other people in the LARP, then we call that too a character. Here's a character as being played to the right. His name is the Belgian chimpanzee. Uh, he comes from a musical LARP where the whole LARP was based on interpreting lyrics. And the lyrics mention that um, uh, somebody lost a drinking competition against the Belgian chimpanzee. And so, of course, the Belgian chimpanzee had to be a character. And the character text says that this is a, a strong fella who uh, cannot lose a drinking competition or any other kind of, of a competition like that. 
Uh, and that's basically it. And so this player here uh, took the strong fellow who doesn't like to lose and doesn't usually lose competitions very seriously. And here we can see him intimidating some other characters at the same LARP. This LARP was run many times. The second one, the guy to the left here, is the Belgian chimpanzee. The mysterious arrival of the Belgian chimpanzee mattered a great deal to him. Nobody really knew where the Belgian chimpanzee came from. He had the same character text. So this Belgian chimpanzee is rather mysterious. It's dark and he's wearing sunglasses. He's wearing a top hat and he walked around with no shoes. Uh, so I think the organizers were all the time looking out for pieces of glass on the floor to make sure he didn't step on them. Uh, didn't say much, but was a very imposing, mysterious physical presence. And at the later run, we have this Belgian chimpanzee. Uh, the girl sitting, standing on the chair here. And the fact that she's standing on the chair and not sitting on it is not a coincidence. She took the chimpanzee-ness of the Belgian chimpanzee uh, to the maximum level of the fader and behaved as much as it could like a chimpanzee to the point of like picking things out of people's hair and so on. And still enjoyed drinking competitions. Now, which one of these characters are the right one and which one are the wrong one? They're all correct. All of these interpretations were valid interpretations of the original character text. And the character text was kind of clear enough about the social function that the Belgian chimpanzee filled in the LARP uh, that it worked out. But I'm talking a lot now about playable characters. So first we need to ask a question, must a character be playable? Is it important for a character to be playable? It's not a rhetorical question because there are LARPs. Uh, such as Prisoner for a Day, uh, which I believe Eric Orebert will talk about, uh, where players are guided through a very strictly choreographed series of events. They might all play prisoners and be bossed around by prison guards, um, or they might all play heroes running around in the forest being chased by orcs all the time. And when you're being chased by orcs all the time, it doesn't matter what your life story was or if uh, your name is impossible to pronounce. In this case, you don't need to worry so much about playable characters because players will not have a great deal of chance to, expect them, to express them. They'll still need alibi and they'll still need some kind of explanation of why they are running around in the forest. But if the LARP needs player initiative, if you depend on the players to actually stand up and do stuff and, and take the LARP to new places and engage their co-players, then yes, you need playable characters. So that's the interesting question then. What's a playable character? We can begin by asking what an unplayable character is. And I'll now introduce you uh, to the most common example I've seen of a thoroughly unplayable character. In fact, I'm going to call this the worst character ever. And it's a character that, uh, when I started LARPing in the 90s, was very often requested. Organizers reacted with frustration when yet another player asked to play this particular character. And that character is Aragorn, <laughs> son of Arathorn the future king of Gondor. In fact, Aragorn, son of Arathorn, is not necessarily unplayable. There could be plenty of playable things about Aragorn. But the particular character wish uh, that was asked so often was of Aragorn at a particular time of his history, when he was hanging around at the inn in Bree, waiting for hobbits to come by. And at this point, he was undercover. Uh, he was undercover. He did not interact with anyone in the bar because they might be spies for the enemy or, or might learn things. So he was just sitting in the corner, smoking a pipe, being mysterious. And as long as there are no hobbits arriving and there are no Nazguls to fight, that sitting around in the corner of the inn being mysterious is incredibly boring. It also adds almost nothing except a tiny bit of scenography to the experience of the other players in the inn. So just by making a list of everything that's wrong about playing uh, Strider, uh, we come into a perspective on what characterizes unplayable characters. They're not visible to the other characters. Um, they make you uncertain or insecure of how to play them. Like, what are you supposed to do exactly? Like, smoke pipe? Uh, they don't have a hook into the current group or LARP. Now, once the hobbits arrive, then Aragorn does have a hook. But in the kind of regular life and the um, and the rumors and the drinking competitions of the inn at Bree, uh, Strider has no function. He can't really go jump up and draw, join the village uh, gossip because he knows nothing about it. Doesn't have anything to do. Uh, it might be based on untrue or unrealistic assumptions of, of the player's playstyle. 
or untrue unrealistic assumptions about the co-player's playstyle. Like, you, know, you might give someone the character of Strider thinking uh, they are going to make like a, a physical role-play masterpiece out of the silent guy in the corner. But if you're not a very physical player, if you're not into playing a very mysterious, moody, silent and introvert game, then that's not going to work. Uh, or you might think, well, just put this guy in the corner and then the other people will approach him and, and draw him into the village gossip. But if they're not that kind of players, are very good at, at uh, drawing in and engaging others, that also is not going to work. So we reverse that, and then we arrive at a thumbnail, set of thumbnail rules for playable characters. They're visible. Other people can see them, they can notice them. Uh, the players know how to play them. They have a hook into the group or the LARP. They have a reason to interact with others, and others have reasons to interact with them. They have things to do beyond smoking a pipe and looking mysterious. They fit the player's play style, and they fit the style of the co-players. In summary, and you don't need to take notes, I forgot to say that, you don't need to take notes of this presentation. Most of the slides are already online, and these will be uploaded after summer school, uh, and they're not very important anyway, except for the next slide. The next slide is super important. That's the only slide you need to remember. And it's a summary. The three qualities of a playable character. First of all, the playable character is clear. The player feels confident that they know how to play the character. That doesn't mean it can't include vague or mysterious or suggestive or inspirational things, as long as the player is aware that this is vague, mysterious stuff that is meant to inspire me. Not this is a secret code that the organizers have passed out, and I don't understand, but probably everybody else understands it, and if I don't figure this out, I'm going to be a bad role player. A good and playable character provides the player with activity, something to do at the LARP, and provides them with connections, connectivity, a place in a group, a place in society, a reason for other people to interact with you, a reason you would have for interacting with other people. And I'm going to spend the remaining half an hour going through in detail what we can do to achieve clarity, activity and connectivity. First of all, clarity which I think in some ways is the most difficult, because I've received a lot of unclear characters and then I end up adding the clarity myself, I feel in the gaps. Uh, the organizer probably meant this. And then I go around screwing up the lop. Are we playing real people? Can, uh, can a drunken Dane who has never met me pretend to be a me? Uh, no, not really. But can he experience the world as a person with very short arms? Yes, he can. He can walk around and try to greet people with very short arms. Uh, and in this way, we'll ha he'll have an experience out of it. He can try to have a funny name and introduce himself to people with a funny name. And that too is an experience that is accessible to him. He can try to, to take this fictional person uh, and turn him into a plausible, a believable person. And he doesn't have to play me, but he, can play, but he needs to play someone that, that could exist. A person that he believes in enough to be able to intuit where this person would go next. And he can pass off to other players as someone that's real within the frames of the LARP. Now, of course, LARPs vary tremendously. Uh, at a very realist LARP, um, the quality, being plausible to other players is harder, requires more attention to detail than one with a very low level of realism. Uh, for example, there is a lop, Fallenest Jana, where everybody plays a thing. They play Mao's little red book or a, a teddy bear, for example. And in this case, having a very accurate body language and uh, the per correct intonation and accent of these characters is probably not very important. But at other lops it is. And when we are trying to play a plausible person, we have several different channels we can use to do so. The mind, often undervalued, but trying to articulate the inner voice of your character, trying to think like the character, can be a way to achieve a plausible character also when you express it to others. Imagining the memories of a character. I know several LARPers do this. They make up memories or they read up fake memories about the character and try to imagine that summer on the beach in 1968. I wasn't even alive in 1968, but my character was. What did it look like? What did it feel like? What did it smell like? What does this memory mean to my character now? And this way you get a shortcut into the character. 
and you can go around the lab struggling with internal questions and this is actually a very meaningful play when characters face enormously important choices or moral dilemmas or social dilemmas to figure out trying to use the way of reasoning of the character figuring out uh, which path to take or you can walk with, work with the body like the third Belgian chimpanzee did work with the way you move through a room the way you greet others the way you inhabit space uh, the way you handshake the way you nod uh, your presence in the room, working with touch and with the physical struggle. The struggle against the microphone or the struggle against the orcs. Um, or you can work with the social self and this is the most common dimension by which we create and, and play characters. To work with how the character behaves in conversation, how the character behaves in relationships and which relationships the character has. Uh, the alternating roles, uh, father, son, uh, king, prince, mother, daughter, sister, and so on, that uh, the one and same character can inhabit many of them. And to explore the character as they relate to the conflict that may or may not take place at the LARP. A playable character does not need to have all these aspects described. This is not a checklist. You can begin, I think, almost with any point in this list, with the body language, or with your relationship to touch and the physical world, or with your relationships and the people that matter to your character, or with your inner voice. And you can use that one focus to begin arriving at the other aspects of the character. And this matters when we design characters, because I'm now going to show you seven different ways we could write one and the same character using different ways of uh, the different channels of input. One of the simplest is to use simply the social role. <coughs> Ronald McGregor is a detective. And we all have some ideas of what's implied by the social role of detective. Uh, which role a detective might take in a police force or a private eye, or which role a detective might take in a crime novel. And this in itself is enough to create a character. The social role and the associations that it brings up. We could be providing a little bit more detail, including the character a little bit more into the fiction. We could say that Ronald McGregor is an alcoholic detective who badly needs a job because he doesn't enough, have enough money for rent. And aha, now he has a motivation as well. He has a reason to interact with other people. He badly needs a job. Was there a murder over there? But he also has a struggle. He struggles with alcohol addiction. Is there a murder over there? One more whiskey, please. We could try to describe him entirely externally. We could say that Ronald McGregor is a man who sits in a slouch posture, nervously fiddles with a cigarette he never lights, and often clenches a whiskey glass in his other hand. He keeps staring curiously at little details other people miss, asks inquisitive questions, as he is always trying to put together pieces of a puzzle. Now, we haven't mentioned that he's an alcoholic, we haven't mentioned that he's a detective, we haven't mentioned that he's unemployed, but a lot of these things are implied by this text, and this text is all about how Ronald McGregor appears to others. So if you try to be this person that other people will see in this way, a lot of the other details of the character will arrive. Then there was a LARP, not going to say much about it, but um, Love in the Age of the Basement. It's about relationships falling apart. And what's interesting about the LARP is that it wrote all the characters as the inner voices. They were, the character text you received was just what your character was thinking. And if we try to write, write Ronald McGregor in this way, he might read something like this. Ashtray flavoured whiskey rolling down my throat. The beat, the beat, yeah, forget them unpaid bills. No use thinking of them. No use drinking, no use not drinking, solve the crime, win the dame. Dub beat up, staring at that thing that doesn't make sense, asking them questions you don't want to ask. What do I care? What should I care? Just a PI, man. You think we have enough to role play on with this text? It's all happening inside his head, but from what's happening inside his head, we can get a pretty good idea of how he behaves regarding others. But why use words at all? You can write characters without using them. Would this picture give, be enough to give an idea of who Ronald McGregor is? Maybe not all the detail, but certainly enough. Or we could describe him entirely in terms of his relationships, his social position. He works at McGregor's detective agency together with Annabel Stark, who is the secretary. Aha, a relationship. Employer secretary. He is a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and the other members are John Harrington, Lady Winterfield, and Harry Corleone, although he is an inactive member. 
Okay, there's some more information. He's married to Lisa Pretty McGregor, although they're divorced, no children. Okay, that wasn't a very happy marriage, was it? And he pays rent to Anna LaFowle. And if we also say in Anna LaFowle's character that Ron McGregor is an unpaying tenant or a tenant who has failed to pay, then we have stories beginning to happen based on that. Uh, a quiet evening with the family, another LARP I shall mention briefly, happened in this location, was based on five different theatre plays. In advance of the LARP, we sat down together with the people in our group. I played once in uh, A Doll's House by Ibsen. Uh, and we read through the entire script. I read my lines, the other uh, cast members read their lines. And then we made kind of an agreement that, okay, we're going to make this happening, but, but of course we're not going to follow the lines of the script. Memorize it and prepare and rehearse and all that stuff. That stuff is boring. We're just going to play. And what I found very interesting about the LARP is that these dialogues, uh, the way we uh, understood our characters by voicing uh, their lines, was actually a very powerful way for us to get an idea of who the characters were. So we could write Ronald McGregor in that way. We could write his character as a dialogue. Are you a detective? Who's asking? One of the wealthiest women in all of Britain. In this case, ma'am, yes, I'm a detective. Are you any good? Shrugs. And we get a pretty good idea of Ronald McGregor's personality and how to play him, how he talks from this kind of text. And finally, I'll introduce you to an anti-pattern. A very common way of writing characters that is also heavily discussed. Ronald McGregor, born in Oxfordshire in 1939. His mother was Helena McGregor, born in 1920 and grown up in nearby Sheepfordshire, the daughter of a Puritan minister, and so on and so on and so on. This character can go on for many, many pages. I think 50 is the unofficial longest record for, or record for the longest written character. Some people really like these characters. And uh, they show a lot of love by the organizers, by the LARP designers. But in order to achieve a playable character, they're absolutely unnecessary. What I really need to know as a player, for the sake of clarity, is what do you expect of me in this LARP? What role do I need to fill? And in addition, I need some input, something to get me on my way so I don't play just the same character as I played the last LARP, and the LARP before that, and the LARP before that, which happens to be myself with a slightly different name. Maybe a change of accent. So to achieve clarity, we need to make sure that players know what we need them to do. Their function in the LARP. If they don't have the function, they can do whatever, then we can be honest about it. Both facts and emotional uh, input is good. Both of them work. Just because we want to be clear doesn't mean we can't also be emotional or inspiring. It doesn't mean we have to be boring. Styles vary, and I've seen a lot of different kinds of characters, and often the character tells you something about the genre of the LARP, not just about this particular character. If you write a character that reads like a page from a detective novel, then you're uh, writing a detective kind of LARP. If you write a character that reads like a person out of a Tolstoy novel, then you're writing a LARP about sad people who are struggling with impossible moral dilemmas. Um, considering the inner monologue, how do I play the character when I'm not moving and not talking? And this is where that kind of uh, the writing the inner voice or describing the character's dilemmas and so on comes in very handy. And stereotypes. Uh, very commonly common to use stereotypes for LARP, and Ronald McGregor is in many ways a stereotype. They make for easy playability because we can draw on all of that cultural knowledge that we have already. All the films we've seen, all the books we've read and so on that have this kind of character in them. Uh, but we need to add something to make them entirely real or plausible. And one of the easiest tricks to add that something is to introduce dissonance. Some part of the character that doesn't fit entirely with the others, but also doesn't break the character. The proud, responsible, caring, loving father, who also has anger management issues. The happy, joking, singing troubadour, but who is still recovering from deep sadness after the death of his lover. And then we come to activity, things to do at the LARP. But before we begin talking about things to do at the LARP, I suggest we all take a moment to play the character of heavy metal musicians doing a power pose. <laughs> so, are we ready? Yes? 
One, two, three. <laughs> Thank you. And a little jump to finish it off. You made it. So beyond uh, Im impersonating heavy metal musicians, what do our characters do? I think the most important question to ask about activities provided for LARP is, can it be done at the LARP? I mean, you, you can write a character who is the world's very best carpenter and who spends all her days uh, building furniture and houses and, and has a magical touch with furniture. But if nobody needs furniture at the LARP, then being the world's best carpenter doesn't provide much activity. Some of these professions that you can give characters do come in handy. You can have a character of the doctor, and if there's a medical emergency, and for some reason, medical emergencies happen quite a lot to the fictional people we play at LARPs, and then suddenly the doctor has activity. The uh, priest also, especially if your characters are Catholic, uh, can have a lot of activities as people come to confess their sins or seek moral guidance. But a lot of professions that we assign to characters, if the LARP isn't about a situation where those professions are relevant, uh, don't help them. Like Aragorn, professional king and sword fighter, sitting in the corner waiting for hobbits, not relevant. <laughs> what does the character do when things change? And this is important, because very often we write LARPs where at the beginning the situation is like this. At the end, the situation is like that. There is a transition. We can't always predict the transition. If we write characters that uh, only have one thing to do, that only have one way of being, they can become very difficult to play the moment things change. If there is a crisis, and crises do happen in LARPs, fictional crises mostly, but if you don't really have an idea of how your character would respond to your crisis, or you've made an interpretation of the character as someone who would just run away and hide, then you might actually get a problem role-playing. Is there a potential in the character for learning new behavior? If your characters are curious, you'll have more opportunities um, to play than if your character is always scared and afraid of other people. I usually, as a, as a thumbnail rule, encourage people not to write introvert characters. That's not because I have anything against introverts, I am one myself, but because having a character is de defined by their introversion, the fact that they get exhausted by interacting with other people and tendency to withdraw from them. And the more extreme we write that character, the harder it is to play. Because then you have a, a plausible reason to play your character in a way that re withdraws uh, from society. If the LARP is about talking, uh, the activity should fit with the activities of the LARP. Uh, so if the LARP is a very verbal game, a game of diplomacy or friends hanging out or whatever, then perhaps it's important to focus on how your character talks, with what voice, about what, in what tone. If the LARP is about fighting, and there are LARPs about that, then it may be much more relevant to focus on the question of whether the character does fight whether a character has reasons to fight, whether the character has reasons to stop fights, whether the character is a peacemaker. The activity thing, uh, dimension of characters, in other words, depends very much on the LARP that you're making. And the activities that you suggest to the players, that you suggest to their characters, need to be connected with what you expect will happen at the LARP. And they need to be flexible enough that they can adapt as the LARP changes. And finally, we come to the most complicated of the three criteria, connectivity. Having a place in the group or society. It's complicated because human beings are complicated people, or complicated animals, and we form very complicated societies, and we form very complicated relationships, more so than any other animal. And as LARP writes, we're trying to approximate that. There are two basic ways we can approach the social reality of a LARP when writing characters. We could either take the top-down approach, begin with the world. This LARP happens in the year 1996, uh, when, uh, when goth bands roamed the earth. Uh, and um, it happens in the society of uh, Denmark. 
and it happens amongst teenagers and the teenagers are these and these people and you can use this in your creative process begin by thinking about the world and themes that you want to explore and then what kind of society you want to explore and then end up with figuring out who the characters are or you could begin the other way you could begin saying we want to make a story about five people and there are five people who have been very very close to each other uh, but now something is happening that is threatening that closeness. And then you can figure out, oh, you know, these should be legionnaires in the Roman army around 200 AD, or these should be a group of friends uh, who have all decided to go to Australia for, st for studies. In this case, you would begin with the characters, and both are valid approaches to lop design. Now, when designing characters for connectivity, it's important to consider what these characters will mean to other people. I'll give you one example. You're in the dark forest at night and you meet this fella. What would you do? Suggestions? Run away. He's Run away? Cute and he likes to drink. Yeah. Looks <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but the, the first uh, impulses were uh, to flee. The first words I heard, I heard I will run away. And that would, I think, also be my instinct of meeting a real-life person like that, unless I suspect him of being a LARPer. But of course, if I was playing a brave knight, I might choose to fight. If I was also an orc, <laughs> then the list of affordances become very different. Affordances are the perceivable possibilities for action. When we interact with things in a lot, things like scenography with other people, with the characters that we see, we immediately read them. And some of the things we read, some of the things we see around us are things that we can act on. And some of those things are much more visible than others. With the orc, the visible, visible thing of fighting or fleeing is very, very clear. If a character is the king, if a character is the boss, if a character is the person who always hangs out by the water cooler in the office and talks shit about management, all of these characters offer us affordances. We don't necessarily need to make explicit their relationships to other people if we make sure that they display clear affordances for play in the LARP. As mentioned, characters must give players a reason to interact with them, and they must have a reason to interact with other characters. And that all comes down to relationships and social structures and visible affordances. But this is all about quality. And that's the tricky part, because I've seen many attempts at, okay, if we write three relationships for each character, everybody will have enough connectivity, right? No, unfortunately not. It depends very much on what kind of relationships. And it also depends a lot on, uh, on which relationships people latch on to. So the designers have provided you with a relationship to a childhood friend. You don't see much, but you can seek out. But the person who plays the childhood friend has hooked on to the relationship with his wife and his father as being incredibly important and spends all the lot playing with them. And when you come over, look, buddy, I have a, I have a problem to discuss with you, then he does not have the time uh, to look towards you. So I'd rather say that less is more that we should focus on a very few re defining a very few relationships, allowing players to initiate more relationships, um, and make sure that those relationships actually make sense. Characters may, and this is not a must, they may have goals and motivations. And in a very classical kind of LARP design, these goals and motivations are very important, where you set up you know, those 10 people over there and those 10 people over there, they want the same thing, but they can't both have it. They have mutually exclusive goals, and so we have conflict, and so we have action, and so we have drama. But it's not necessary. We can use more fine-grained tools than that. But if we give someone a goal, we give them an order that you want to do this. You want to kill the king. Goals alone are very inflexible things in lab design. Because the moment somebody else kills the king, or the king falls down the stairs, or the king falls asleep and uh, is poisoned by a snake who bites him in the air, totally plausible. Uh, when that happens, then our character no longer has a goal. Motivations are much more interesting. You want the king to be dead because you want to be the king, or because you hate people in authority. You're an anarchist. You want to overturn the state. All of these things help us find new goals and new things to pursue once the original goal is gone. And they also allow for a deeper exploration of the inside mind of the character. Characters may have conflicts with other characters, but it's not necessary. They may have puzzles to solve. 
they may have fates, predetermined events to do. A lot of stuff is written about these different dramaturgical tools that can be used. But a lot, and you can look it up online. But a lot of this stuff is today seems very old-fashioned. Secrets. Characters who have sec belong to secret groups or have secret identities. This is tricky stuff. You'll hear more about it when we come to the transparency fader. Uh, but keep in mind that secret identities can make for difficult play. Strider has a secret identity. He is the future king of Gondor, but it doesn't matter as long as he's hanging out in, the, in that brie. If it's never revealed, it's not very interesting. But if it is revealed, the moment the Hobbits arrive and the Nazgul's arrive, then the secret identity can become interesting. If you have a secret community, if you have uh, evil cultists plotting to overthrow the world, or you have a faction of the political party that is seeking to change party leadership, or whatever, as a LARP designer, you'll also need to provide them with places to meet and things to do when they meet there, or this community doesn't exist. So the bottom line is that the secret is never revealed or never comes into play. It, um, it doesn't really matter to the LARP. Uh, but, as, but if it comes into play, it can be a cool surprise. Use them with care. The three affiliations model. This model was invented for our Norwegian LARP 1942. Uh, which happened in the year 2000, and which is being rerun next year. Uh, some of the organizers are here. Uh, the LARP uh, basically set up a so local society in uh, a village in the west coast of no Norway in 1942. And to simulate this village, I arrived in this model, which has been used by many other LARPs. You define a character along three axes. A character has a workplace. A character has friends. A character has family. The workplace might be the fishing boat, the friends might be the illegal poker game, and the family might include a wife who is a member of the anti-gambling league. This makes a lot of sense when the LARP actually gives you the possibility, as that LARP did, to explore all these three axes. That you have a workplace, and that means you actually work in character. That you have friends, and that means that the illegal poker game actually needs to meet. And you have family, that means you must share dinners and, and spend time with the role-played family. If you don't have a LARP with this kind of structure, then the three affiliations models doesn't necessarily make, uh, can't be used outright, but it can inspire similar structures. At short LARPs, and by short LARPs I mean pretty much every LARP that's been run here, anything below a day or below four hours, um, characters need focus. Less is more, and you need to have a very clear idea of what this character is going to do. Because even if the character has plenty of possibilities for change and transformation and exploring new things, in one or two or three hours you won't have time to explore those possibilities. If you're writing characters for long LARPs, and there have been LARPs as long as six, six seven days, uh, or three weeks in fact, when they mix with real life, then the character needs depth. Then they definitely need the time to change, to pursue different play opportunities, uh, and more complexity. So we return to that one slide I, I said to remember. Clarity and activity, connectivity, the three things you need to have a playable character. I'm going to end with two slides. The first is this one. This is, a, you can't probably read from that distance, but you can find this online. Uh, Mad About the Boy, um, a LARP that was run, I think, 2000, 2010? Yeah, and it's been rerun several times since. And the characters are all online, which is not that common. So you can go and read them, and I, they happen to be what I think are some of the best characters ever made for LOPs, because they illustrate in all the different content here, both very fa clear factual content that tells you what's your character's function in the group, in the LARP, what are your play possibilities. But they also contain inspirational material, stuff that can direct you towards making this character more living, more whole, more plausible as a person. And I said initially that nothing is true, everything is permissible, and every rule has exceptions. And I talked about the problem of writing highly introvert characters. And still, a few years ago, I played a LARP where there was a character defined as extremely introvert, and it worked very well. And the character is sitting down there to the right, uh, was played by uh, Tuchetil. Uh, and the character worked at this LARP for a couple of reasons. The first of all, there were only eight other characters and they were having a dinner. So being quiet at the dinner was actually, was actually still being part of the dinner and part of the conversation. Secondly, the designer 
in advance of the LARP played through scenes with each and every pair of characters so that plenty, all the other characters had an idea of what their friendship to this guy meant and how they related to his lack, lack of social action. It wasn't that he never talked to people, but he preferred to talk to one person at a time and would usually shut out the conversation if there were too many people talking at once. And so there is no rule about character writing without excep exceptions. Uh, and I hope to see many more characters that break many more rules. There remains a lot of uncharted territory in our understanding of what does it mean to play characters, what does it mean to play roles, and how can we make really good characters for great LARPs. Thank you.